Hi, I'm Christina Toysher. And I'm Katie Miley. And this is Columbia Olympians one-on-one. So Katie, being two decades older than you, <laughs> I would love to hear what your experience was like swimming at Columbia um, and going four floors underground to Eurus <laughs> to swim. Yeah, well, um, so good to see you and talk to you. I haven't you in a while now and definitely since not pre-pandemic. So I'm excited for this conversation. But I mean, yeah, I'm actually curious to hear how my experience differs from yours because I feel like they're probably very similar in a lot of respects because same pool, same coach, Yeah, um, which is really cool. And something that um, like when I was going through the recruiting process and I was first looking at Columbia, I remember coming onto the pool deck and seeing the record board and seeing so many of Christina's names up and being like, oh my gosh, like um, that's so cool. Like an Olympian swam here and like a recent Olympian. And uh, it kind of just opened my eyes to the idea that you can be, you know, high achieving academically and go to this incredible school, but you can also be really high achieving athletically. And it was one of the big draws for me. And then um, we had, we both had Diana, who has been a wonderful influence in my life and was such a unique, but amazing coach. And I think I credit a lot of my success post-college, well, obviously my success in college, but sort of my post-college success of swimming, but also just life to her sort of um, mentorship and guidance. So yeah, I mean, in terms of day-to-day, it's it's like you think about swimming anywhere and it was a lot of hard work, but a, a ton of fun. And I, I think the coolest thing about swimming at Columbia specifically was just, well, one, I think it's really special to compete in the Ivy League in any sport and um, especially being in New York City. It's just we had so much sort of at our fingertips and there was so much going on and everybody was so accomplished and doing really exciting, great things, like whether it be internships or going abroad or there was just um, such a wealth of culture to interact with and experience. And I just I always tell people because people sometimes look back, they're like, oh, that's interesting. You went to Columbia. You didn't go to like a big swimming school or a big powerhouse conference. And I always say, I swear, like Columbia just, it made me who I am, but I was also so happy there. Like it was such a wonderful experience and enriching time that I think that that's why I was able to swim so fast because I just was thoroughly, I like enjoyed every single piece of it from classes to um, fellow students, to the team coaches, um, the pool, you know, it was, <laughs> yeah, it's four stories underground for those of you that don't know. And it's a bit tight, but like it was cozy and kind of like homey to me. And I just yeah. have lots of good memories there. So I loved it. But what about you? Yeah, I, I it resonated so much with me. I remember, I think when I, um, when I signed, like I, when I signed, when I said I was going to Columbia, I remember one coach like made a snarky remark. He's like, well, she's hanging up her suit. And I was like, what? for me, it was the balance of all of it. It was like, I fell in love with the core curriculum. So what you were saying, like the arts, music, the fact that you take classes in that, but then you're also using the city um, as, you know, as a classroom as well. I, I loved that. I love the fact that I could drop my swim bag and go to class. And there was like an anonymous aspect to that. It was like, it didn't matter if you had to be training for Olympic trials, like you better be here and take your midterm. And that had grounded me a lot. And it helped me feel a good sense of like, okay, I, perspective in life, because swimming is just one part of it. But, you know, education is the bigger part of it. So um, it is really funny. Diana should probably be part of this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I last saw her, I say, hey, Diana, how are you? She's like, she says, I feel so old. And I'm like, no. I'm like, if anything, she, I think, looks the same. I think she looks great. And I have to agree. Um, she was a big part for me. She was really, I hadn't had a female coach since I was like six, seven years old. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was just so many ways in the way I thought. And I thought I had to like suck it up and during, and she'd be like, uh, uh-uh. she's like, that's not fair. Or, and it was so helpful to have that. Right. It was very anchoring for me and it helped me. I swam my fastest, um, actually 
um, my my sophomore and my my senior year there, I had some of my best swims of my life. And I think yeah. being surrounded by that team, but also with her support, um, it was just a wonderful, it was a wonderful um, addition, kind of made me more well-rounded even in the swimming piece. So I love that. I loved, one of my favorite parts was walking across college walk to morning yeah. workout, but not in February. I was <laughs> just Not like, when it was frozen in. I know, but when you see like those gorgeous flowers, um, I love that near like Low Library. It's just, it's so beautiful. Um, New York in the spring. So there were just things like that that I'm like, how many people can say they get to swim in New York City at the same four floors underground, but still, you'd understand why. <laughs> yeah. Buildings above. Um, so, but I wanted to ask you, like, what was your, I mean, with Columbia, you were there and then you you transitioned which you did something really cool which I think it would be cool if you kind of explained um where you went after Columbia that you started training for the Olympics um and talk about that experience and your experience going to the games that yeah, yeah. definitely well it's so interesting that you so you started you were at an Olympics before Columbia is that right or yeah I bookended I was 96 and then 2000 and yes so Fresh it's forever. it's really interesting hearing you speak because you kind of had had that experience and that's a different perspective than what I had and it's like I love what you say about you know you needed the balance and the perspective of just being a normal human and I think that you were probably like well ahead of your time with that thought because even now like that's you know we can talk about it later when swimming is becoming like it's, you're able to do it professionally and you're kind of able to have a career, but yeah. I talk often about making sure that you're a, like a full human being outside of the pool too. And that gets lost because in, in all sports, right. But it's very consuming and sort of very time consuming and mental energy consuming. So I just love that you made that decision after you had already had like the, the most success you could have in the sport. I think that's so special, but um, yeah, so I did it. I didn't bookend. I, I came to Columbia and I improved a lot during um, my time there. And then, you know, I was still improving and I was still loving it. And actually Diana and our assistant coach at the time, Michael sort of had a conversation with me about continuing on. And um, there, there wasn't very many opportunities to swim as a postgraduate or to sort of swim professionally. And um, I mean, there were a few people here and there doing it, but most of the time you would stay with your college team or you, you'd kind of like swim for one more year to finish out the cycle. And then that'd kind of be I it. There was more pro. There wasn't that much pro when you were. There wasn't. So it was like kind of right. At, it was like right at the cusp, I think. That's, because, it. That's so cool. Um, and I and then when I went looking for teams, I mean, there was really only one team, which is the team I ended up at. And that's kind of where everybody went that didn't have like a college program that could sustain, you know, like a postgraduate college program. And since then, so that was in 2013. So really in, you know, seven, eight years, it's really blown up, which I love so much. And now there's a lot more opportunity. Um, but yeah, so I didn't really know what it looked like. I didn't really know how I would do it. And like you said, a lot of people were like, you're going to do what? Like you just graduated from Columbia. Like, why aren't you going to get a job? Like, on Wall Street, what are you thinking? And that was tough for me to overcome because I hadn't proved myself yet. And I think even for myself, like I didn't really know, I didn't believe in myself enough, but to Diana and Michael's credit, they really down and they were like, we think you have so much potential. Like we think you can make an Olympic team. And I was like, you guys are insane, but they really fostered it. So they connected me with the coaches and I sort of looked at different places. And then I didn't even really decide until probably March of my senior year. So I, I was ready to be done with swimming. like when I graduated, oh, I did not know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, because I was just sorry, all the more. Wow. Yeah. And, and I, I remember going to a meet in Charlotte, which is where I ended up moving to train. Um, and that's where I met the coach. And I remember texting my mom. So I, I actually think that was like May. So maybe a week or two before graduation. And I texted my mom and I said, I think I'm going to move to Charlotte and I think I'm going to keep swimming. And she was like, I want you to follow your dreams, like follow your heart. Um, and so it was a very kind of last minute decision for me. And, you know, it, it was a, it was a long, tough journey because to, I was good, right? Like I was good collegiately and I had um, uh, been top three at NCAAs, which is like quite an accomplishment, but I wasn't quite at that level to make an Olympic team, which is like, instead of being best in the country, you kind of have to be, or best in, you know, collegiate swimming, you have to be best overall. And 
there are different pools, the, the pool that, you know, the Olympic system that is longer. And so there's just a, a little bit of a different skill set that I had yet to develop. And so, yeah, it was kind of a leap of faith for me. A lot of people, and including my coach, David Marsh, who, you know, I love and respect very much, but I think I showed up and he was kind of like, who are you? <laughs> like, what are you doing here? Um, He's and, older. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Olympic coaches when I was there. So. <laughs> yeah. um, there were a lot of tough days, like, right. Like I had a lot to learn and, you know, making an Olympic team and going through trials yeah. and then performing at the games is very, very difficult in terms of mentally and like the pressure and sort of I had never competed on that level and I had to learn how to handle that very quickly, probably more accelerated than most people. So while I was improving physically, I was also kind of like, you know, sharpening up and toughening up and being able to handle the pressure of like a prelim semifinals finals at an Olympic trials where, you know, it's all or nothing. So um, it was a great, I mean, David's a great coach. He was very tough on me, but I said, I think that's what I needed. And it worked out. So, I, I mean, I could not be happier that I made the decision, but yeah, it was interesting, like kind of weird windy road for me, which not a lot of times you see, I think you see a lot of young, especially female swimmers kind of come up quickly and then they like go to these certain schools and then they stay good until they kind of retire. And I just, you know, I, I could yell it from mountaintop that you can do it differently. You know, you can improve at age 25, um, you just have to find like the right resources and be willing to do the work. I'm really impressed because it, it almost puts more pressure on you that way, because it's like, it, it's this feeling of like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this chance. Were you studying for your LSAT during that time? What were, I'm impressed because yeah. I see a lot of people, like I went pro for one year after um, swimming and it was like, I was swimming with 14 year olds. Like so there's, I, was right. like, I, gotta, I gotta do something else. Like I, <laughs> you know, after a year, I was like, I can't do this. Um, but it, it, it was also, I mean, when I was just doing that, I was getting heady and yeah. I felt like there was this expectation that I had to be doing it. But to have that as like the soul after, and you're seeing people kind of move on, I'm impressed because it, it takes, it takes a lot of grit to stick with it. Yeah, it was great. Um, but can you, I want to hear about your sort of journey coming, you know, to the, yeah, my daughter, sorry, are you guys oh, yeah. in the background? She, she'll probably swing by here and start talking. I <laughs> can't wait to see her. <laughs> um, so I, it's so funny. I think I, my swimming, like my parents were not swimmers. I grew up, I just loved the water. It was always just a place like I always played. And I think I, I kind of, I found my my coach, John, um, basically by going through a city funded program, my team melted into his team type thing. I moved to his senior team. It all kind of just fell into place. And I remember I won, I won my first national title at 16. And it up to that stage, it was kind of just like this obliviousness. Like I was very naive, not paying attention. I mean, you have to think about it. We weren't on the internet. You're not like checking times with people, but my John would be telling me, Lena and Riley, and he'd be like, Janet Evans did that this morning, but she swam way faster than you. I'd be like, shut up. <laughs> right. It's like, this isn't helpful to be saying this stuff to me. So it, it's like, I kind of was in a bubble. And then all right. of a sudden, when I made my first games, I, I just felt the weight of the world on my shoulders because yeah. it was like Janet was the reigning queen. It was like, are you the next? Are you going to do it? And I was not prepared for that. So my first Olympics was not like great in my individual events. I, I think I was putting too much pressure on myself. And then um, the relay was coming in and they basically were going to take me off of it. And I had to fight for my spot. Yeah, I remember. I remember that. kind of going to like, thinking about what I remember, um, that made me swim fast. I was like trying to get back to like, and at, you know, at 18, you're kind of just like your eyes wide. I mean, you're not used to so many people and right. this was held at, at, in Atlanta. So think of going to where swim meet where literally your mom is like obliged to be there because she has to pick you up and drive you off. I'd been to the biggest meet before that was Olympic trials, which was a few you know, months before. And this one, all of a sudden there were 17,000 fans in the stands and they're cheering for you because you have an American cap on. They don't even know how to say your last name, but it was like, it was deafening. And yeah. uh, I just had to kind of get back to just like, okay, I know that if I enjoy this, I'm like, if I just, I got to let it go and just have fun with this race. Um, 
And we ended up doing great in that relay. We won gold. Um, I swam my fastest split in U.S. history, which now is kind of a joke. If I tell you the time I did, Katie it's was still like, fast, oh, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's so it's so wild to watch swimming now. And so yeah. I think that was one of those things where I was like so happy when I went to Columbia because I knew I could have that balance that I had always maintained mm-hmm. before. But also that I said to myself, if I'm going to swim, like, and I'm going to continue on the national team, it has to be fun because if not, this is just going to be a disaster. Um, and so that was my goal. When I went back in 2000, I spent a lot of time with like, we had 14 year olds on the team. I spent a lot of time with them because they were just like, not thinking about anything, like focusing on like, wow, I wonder what's right. going on in Olympic village just in the moment. Right. And that part I think was important for me to like keep that type of energy because I didn't do that in the first Olympics. Um, and we just, there wasn't like a lot of that type of training. And I'd be curious to know like what kind of support you guys had in that sense. It was more of like, they'd give us, they would have conversations with us, the USOC, like the national team director would be like, we're number one in this sport. You all better win Olympic gold. We expect you to win Olympic gold. <laughs> You're sitting there going like, like we're going to try to fail on purpose. Like what right. kind of conversation? Yeah, that's is? so interesting. So I, I'm curious to know what your experience was like in that and how much more sophisticated probably the whole support yeah. system is in that respect. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, have, we had such incredible support and it's so interesting to hear you say that. Also, yeah. you like for anyone listening, it is, it is like really hard to make an Olympic team and to make two Olympic teams and also to do it like while you were balancing Columbia is just like, it's just so impressive and so amazing. So I, like, I have always um, obviously looked up to you, but like hearing your story and, and yet, I mean, be, imagine being 16 and just all of a sudden the best in the country, but like, you're still a kid. And how do you even process that? And you're like on the world stage. I can't, that's, yeah, it's a really interesting um, perspective and really difficult. And I think, you know, so I came, I was 25 when I first swam and I think I had the benefit of swimming, you know, of going to Columbia, but then also swimming as a pro for three years prior. And we had done a lot of traveling and I had sort of, like you said, trained for that so that I didn't get there and feel like completely overwhelmed. And while I will say trials to me was still so overwhelming and absolutely terrifying. Isn't it? It's yeah. And like, we can talk about the difference, but yeah. once to the games, I just kind of felt so supported by all of team USA. And, and that's like all of the swimming teammates, but also all the other athletes. And then the support staff just goes, you know, out of their way. We have, we're so lucky to have such great, um, uh, great sort of infrastructure there. And it was very much, and I tell people this and they kind of like laugh because my, the way I approached it. So I didn't get overwhelmed was to just kind of tell myself, it's just another swim. Like there's nothing special about this one. And then, so while, and everyone's like, what was it like? What was it like? While I was there, I was very much focused on it being just another swim meet. So I like try not to let myself get you know overwhelmed or like get sort of like taken back by all the people or all of the kinds of goings and then after I was done swimming I was I was kind of reflecting and being like wow that was like so cool but I I tried very much not to think about this this scale of it um while I was there because that you know for for people like us like for swimmers we don't compete on that level we're not used to that kind of attention I remember my Instagram, I went from like having 6,000 followers and the night I swam, I had 40,000. Like I, it jumped like, Oh my God. Tens of thousands in one night. Yeah. And um, can you tell me how you kept your head on straight with social media as like another layer to that, because that's remarkable to me. It's yeah. And it's, I'll be interested to see how it goes this year, because I think it's even so much more evolved now, like with TikTok and like, it's, it's like a way to monetize yourself and to brand yourself outside of the sport. And in 2016, we were kind of there, but like not quite everyone was still just, you know, posting like pictures of themselves on their newsfeed, but it was like before stories and the videos and all of the stuff. So I didn't, I tried very hard not to look at my phone or like look at social media while I was competing. And then afterwards, like I like dug into the messages and it was all very positive for me. And it was people that, we're reaching out that I haven't heard from in a long time, but 
I mean, I, I think about Lily King's yeah. situation who called out the Russian doper and got, you know, the flip side of that. She got, she had a lot of great attention, but she got some pushback and she was also very young. I think she was 19. And um, I, I know that was hard for her sort of navigating that. So yeah, it definitely adds an element of difficulty. It's just, I'm so impressed with that because think about it in 96, you know what they gave us, Katie? What? Beepers. <laughs> <laughs> And we were all like, what are we, drug dealers? <laughs> and you could, families could send you, you could get a message. You Little had like messages. A automated yeah. personnel. You call your beeper and listen to your Wow. <laughs> and um, when we had, like, when the, it, they actually were useful when, you know, 96, the Atlanta bombing happened. Right. We were out. It was yeah. the first night swimming was over. We were out yeah. and a lot of us were near the park. And wow. they said, come back. They were like, come back. There's been an issue. And we're all like, we're not going back. Yeah. <laughs> and then they had another one. They're like, village lockdown must return. Oh so my gosh. Like, wow. Back. So like the captains were trying to corral all of us together and get us like out to like cabs and stuff like that. But that, I mean, we just had no contact. Even right. in like, Sydney Olympics, it was cool because swimmers there are like football equivalent here in this country. Right or baseball equivalent um there if you got in a cab they knew who you were like they know all the swimmers yeah that was pretty fascinating but it's because they read about you in the gossip columns uh so they they understand like they follow something that way right, but right. not because anyone you know they 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 would see you get in they'd see your gear and they'd be like what are you what are you? and then you'd say your name and they know but not because they see you not because oh, right it's such a different it was such a different experience in that yeah. respect um it's a whole other element it's just you have to be so much more professional uh, i think that's right you have to be more careful about what goes out and and just be you know willing to take whatever comes back from it which is a tough lesson especially for young people right that have never sort of dealt with that. So, um, but again, like good support. And I think we relied on each other a lot in that, like we kind of, in my head, like, right, like my social media bubble was just my teammates and my friends. So like, I would post things, like we just kind of were like one unit and that helped take some of the autonomy off of it. It was like, you know, we're all kind of in this together, but it was definitely interesting. And I remember thinking like, this is a new, you know, piece of the Olympic games. And it, it's obviously only going to continue to grow, but I think it's so cool that you can feel like connected to a Simone Biles or like know what she was thinking when she was competing. Cause she tweets it afterwards. Like, I think that's yeah awesome, but yeah, but definitely different than what's happened in the past. <laughs> Very different. I'm like, wow. <laughs> um, talk to me about your, the Olympic village experience. Did you have anything like a really funny or surreal experience in there? Uh, so actually, yes. And I feel like everyone has one. So I want to know what yeah. yours are. <laughs> but um, so we were in Rio and, you know, I, I thought Rio did an incredible job putting on the games, but there was some, like, they hadn't quite finished a, a, a few things at, in the village. And I remember like Team USA, the USOC came in and actually finished our building. So like that we would have running water. And I remember that was like, they were coming up to the timeline and buildings weren't finished. But um, for the most part, everything was great, except one day, the, actually the day of the 100 breaststroke, the, day, the morning of my prelims, there was a windstorm. And I walked to the uh, dining hall, which is like, oh my gosh, when you walk in, right, it's like six football fields and it's all in a big tent. And it's just, it feels like miles of food options and tables and chairs and every, you know, every Olympian eats in there. But so I walked in and so it's this, you know, temporary tech tent structure, but like with some structure and they had these hanging pendant lights and the wind was blowing the whole tent. So the lights were like swinging. <laughs> I, I was in there at a weird time because in Rio, the uh, Olympics were at like prelims started at 1 PM and finals started at 11 PM so that we could be. Oh my gosh, that's right. So we were competing at a very, very strange time for us, but also in general, like, I think I swam the hundred breaststroke final at like, uh, 12 54 AM. And like my medal ceremony was like at one 30 in the morning, but, um, and we had kind of just shifted our day. So I was getting breakfast at like 11 30 or 12 to go to prelims. And they, there weren't very many people in there and they just come running in and they were like, we're closed. Like, get out, get out. Cause they were afraid the tent was going to collapse. And I did it. Um, 
I, I was by myself and I didn't eat. And I just like went to the bus and I got to the pool and I was like, I haven't had breakfast. Everyone was like, what's going on? I was like, I don't really know. Like, you know, you're stressed and you're nervous. And um, somebody from NBC, like one of the uh, production guys went to McDonald's to get me breakfast that morning, which was so nice and funny. So but sweet. Very bizarre. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, the village was great. The, the, the people were great. So yeah, that was my one funny experience. But what about you? Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I'm trying to think of like, probably I think we saw, we saw Hootie and the Blowfish. And oh, they, that's they cool. Came into, they came into the village. I'm trying to think of like some fun things. A lot of the team got to meet Muhammad Ali actually. And wow. I, knew him because I was um, at the pool, but he had been in there. Um, I, 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 I would say the, the, probably the coolest parts were just riding, especially when you were done with your competition and then just being amongst others who were kind of done. And the energy yeah. was just like palpable in the, right. everybody was just letting mm -hmm. loose and having fun. And in the Atlanta one, they had a club in there, but not a lot of people went there. Um, I, yeah, I, I would say what was probably more fun about it um, was the time afterwards outside of the village. <laughs> so much in the village people are always asking about like the con that yes. is out everyone's so obsessed about asking i'm like everyone like cleared it out the first day because they wanted them because they had olympic rings on them so there was like none there was you didn't even could get one as like a piece of so funny. or something so <laughs> yeah um but uh how about with um we're going to ask about you. And so achieving success. So meddling individually, meddling with a relay team reaction on the final touch and like realizing when you won your medal, what was that? For yeah. You? Well, actually, okay. Let's, I'm going to wind it back to trials. Cause I feel like this is like, people always ask yeah. like, the difference between trials and the Olympics. And for me personally, and I'm sure you have similar thoughts. I, I think trials is a harder meet than the Olympics. And I yeah. think it's, um, it's definitely more stressful. So the U.S. is so good at swimming and there's so many people in every event, um, but you can only make the team if you're top two in an individual and top six in a, in a relay event. And so it's just an incredible amount of pressure. But like if the person who got third, for example, in the hundred breaststroke at trials went to the Olympics, they could have easily medaled. Like that's how much, yeah. uh, I mean, there are, you know, other swimmers in the world that are incredible, but as a whole, the U.S. just, just so deep and so strong. So it's, it's really like iron fighting iron at trials to get a spot on the team. And I remember, um, I remember feeling like prepared and I had kind of, you know, been like rehearsed that in my head quite a bit leading up to it. And I, I and I knew my goal was to make the team and, and to move on to the games. But I just remember the day, you know, the day before I raced and our events take place over two days. So you swim prelims and semifinals on the first day, and then you come back and swim finals try and make the team on the second and I just remember um that whole 48 hours just being like almost sick I, I kind of felt like I had the flu I was so nervous and I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep yes. and I just remember thinking like I could have the best swim of my entire life and still not make this team and that's like a very hard pill to swallow especially when you're kind of in a place to make to make it and so once I was like okay with that and once I kind of accepted that that that's just, you know, that's the reality of where I was. It, I could, I calmed down a little bit and just was like, okay, if I don't make it, you know, my, my parents are still going to love me. Like I still have had this wonderful adventure, like kind of being like, what is the alternative here? Because it is, it does feel sure. like the world. Yeah. So, I mean, I was still terrified. I don't remember my race at all. Um, barely remember. I mean, I like vaguely remember my warm up and walking out, but I don't remember diving in or really even finishing I just remember kind of turning around and seeing the, the two and like just triple checking it to make sure like, cause I think I was also in lane two and, um, and just, it was the wave of emotion that like rolled through my body and off of me at that time was unlike anything I've ever experienced. And I, you know, I got out, I was crying. I heard David, I went to go back. Cause you like kind of go back and you, and you do media almost immediately. And there was a USA swimming person there handing us like a bottle of water before we would walk to media and like handing us our credentials and stuff. And I just broke down. Like I, I like crumpled to the ground in tears and she was like, um, are you okay? Like, I was like, 
yeah, just give me a second. Like it, it just incredible amounts of emotion. And so once like I was kind of through that, the Olympics was more of like, and then I don't want to like put it lightly, but it kind of felt like the cherry on top. Like I knew that the hard part was going to be making the team. And then once you're there, you know, you know, you're competitive with the rest of the world, you know, you're in a pretty good spot to medal. You just kind of have to go swim your race. And, um, I, I was still nervous at the Olympics, of course, but it was, I just remember it being such a lighter feeling experience and like a happier and the nervous at trials was nervous, terrified. And the nervous at the Olympics was nervous, excited, which is where you want to be anyways. And so, yeah, I just, I remember much more of my Olympic experience because I think because I was <laughs> enjoying it. Um, awesome. and, and I just remember sort of, I remember seeing my parents and my family in the stands when I walked out. And one thing that was really cool about the Rio venue was that it was really colorful. Like they had done, the stands were like all different, like oranges and blues and greens. And so many people from around the world were there and um, everyone just cheered for everyone, which was really special. And I just remember walking out and seeing like an erupted crowd when my name was announced and just being like, how cool is this? That like swimming has brought me to this moment. And so it was all a very sort of surreal, but blissful experience. And the medal was just, I mean, I, it was like a dream come true. And it's hard to describe, like, I say surreal in these words that don't really, it's very abstract, but um, I just, I still, sometimes I can't believe it. Like I, it, it happened, you know, and, and being on the podium. And so I got bronze in the hundred breaststroke and Lily King got gold. So we, you know, we saw, I heard our anthem um, as our flags were raised and it was all very, very special. Yeah. That's really nice. Um, I want to hear about your relay experiences because you have, I know you have a lot of great relay stories in your, every time people talk about Christina, they talk about your relay. (laughs) Relays. Um, well, I can definitely relate to what you said about Olympic trials. I think Olympic trials is a harder meet. And for those of you who don't know, only top two, in each event, make it to the Olympics. And usually the top eight final of an Olympic trials is faster than the top eight final of an Olympic games. So in the US at least, our our Olympic trials are super fast. So there's a lot of pressure in that sense. Although kudos to those who are doing it right now that they're doing it waves. I'm like, I can't imagine what it's like. So they're holding in three waves because of COVID. It's like eight days. Eight day, uh, I don't know how they're doing that because um, some have to go yeah. on. The next <laughs> um, so, yes, so I swam two individual events, the two and four free, and then um, at 96, and then the relay. And I had actually made the four by one relay and they took me off of it. Yeah. Um, and I was on the four by two relay. And like I said, they didn't want me, I, I had the fastest 200 split, but they didn't want me going first or last. I think they were scared I was going to be like not like I'd lose it and then they would lose we would lose a relay it's you have these kind of conversations right it's like that right so it was basically like they put me second and um I the group they Francie van Omsik had led off for the Germans and um she had the world record for the 200 at that point so I knew I'd be playing catch-up so right I remember just going like okay I, I felt a lot of pressure I think I from 16 to 18, it's just, I wish that was one piece I, you know, had, um, learned a little bit more about kind of dealing with the pressures of, uh, but I, I was just trying to get back to that, like, let's just race and have fun. And, um, they couldn't start the relay because the crowd was chanting USA. We were the underdogs. The Germans were supposed to win and president Clinton and Hillary and Chelsea were there. Um, rumor was it that Chelsea had a crush on one of the male swimmers. So she made her parents go every I'm day. Just swimming. <laughs> so Jenny Thompson was the anchor on the relay. And she said, girls, I want to meet the president. So we're winning tonight. <laughs> I was like, Jenny, let's try to keep it light. Let's have some fun here. <laughs> so I was just like trying to relax about it. So um, I don't really remember so much of my race. I just remember like you turn your head to breathe and you would just hear a roar of a crowd yeah. and to feel that vibration in the water is no, tremendous. It's, cool. it's just mm-hmm. so it's wild to me. Um, swimming is such a solitary and intimate sport. I think in many ways, cause it's just you and you're in the water and that's it. And this wasn't, <laughs> this is like a total out of body experience. I felt like, yeah. and, um, so I remember, um, 
touching I, and gave the lead to um, Sheila Tarmina who went third and she held it, made it longer. And then Jenny um, just fought for it at the end and we ended up breaking the Olympic record. And it was very exciting. Um, I remember feeling relief actually more, which is kind of sad. Like I, you had the quintessential Olympic experience. And so that was my goal when I went back in 2000. So I was Olympic team captain in um, 2000. And for me, it was all about having fun. And I actually made it in um, the 200 I am in the 200 free, but I let go of the 200 free and, and focus on the 200 I am. And um, they had told me I was gonna be on the relay. And then the last minute they took me off, it was all this politics, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up swimming my best time. I won the bronze in the 200 I am. And that was a great, um, that was great. I actually really enjoyed that race more. Yeah. I, I'm curious, like, ready room experience. Did you have any, the girl behind me blew down my neck as I was, walking. <laughs> I literally turned around. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, do you think stuff is going to work? I was like, whatever. Oh, I would but not have, did you have any experiences like that in the ready room, so which is the our ready room was, it out. was actually uh, a little bit wild because so backstory. And I mentioned this earlier, uh, there was a Russian breaststroker, Yulia Fomova, who had tested positive twice for, uh, doping and she had been suspended twice. And she was supposed to be suspended from the Olympics, yeah. but her over her suspension got overturned the night before swimming started. So she had come to Rio, like she knew, right? And I knew, I think everyone kind of knew that was going to happen. Um, That's crazy. It's crazy. And the issues of like the Russian doping, I, you know, I like to blame people higher than the individual athletes, but I mean, like it's, it, it's a systemic problem and it was happening and we were watching it happen. And, um, so Lily had like sort of, when we got the news that Yulia was going to compete literally the next morning, it was insane. Lily had said something like in the dining hall or like she, she had like started stirring about how she was going to beat her. And she was like excited. She was racing because she couldn't wait to take out like someone who was drug cheating. So that was like the stage was set a little bit. And then in prelims, like everything was fine. And then in semifinals, so Lily was in the second semifinal and Yulia was in the first semifinal. And so Yulia swam, she almost broke the world record. It was like an incredible semifinal swim. And she holds up a number one. Um, like, on like <laughs> yes. So Lily is in the ready room. I also think I was in the first semifinal. So this was like kind of, it was beyond my like controllable. So I wasn't paying too close attention, but there are cameras in the ready room and Lily didn't know that there's also a TV. So you can watch the meet and you like see what, you know, the heat before you does. And so as Yulia holds up her finger, Lily holds up hers and like wags it at her. But Lily thought she was doing that to herself and she didn't realize it was on the NBC broadcast. So Lily swims her semifinal, you know, great swim, whatever. As we're like getting on the bus to go back to the village that night, Lily's phone just starts absolutely blowing up and everyone is like, oh my gosh. And, um, so like the media had built this huge thing about like the US versus Russia rivalry and like Lily's calling out the drug cheat and, you know, making it well known, which is all great. And so we get to the final and, and Lily is very much the type of competitor. Like she said it in her interview. She's like, I hate losing. Like my goal is to win. My goal is, she's just very blunt about it. And um, she was trying to like get a little bit of a reaction out of Yulia in the ready room. And Yulia was like kind of avoiding her and other women had sort of like- What was she doing? Sides. So Yulia was sitting in a chair with her eyes looking down and like her kind of her shoulders on her knees, like very much hunched over, hunched down. So she didn't have to like look up at him. And Lily was like, kind of like trying to get under her, like trying to get her to look at her, right? To be like, look at me, like we're going, um, and it was just, I just remember being like, what is happening? Like I'm in an Olympic final and like, there's all this drama all of a sudden that's kind of came out of nowhere. And so I remember very much being like, I don't want to walk out there and think about, you know, this fight between Yulia and Lily. I want to walk out there and be like, this is, you know, my race and like the moment I've been looking for. And I kind of separated myself from them. I like stood back a little bit. So I just kind of let them. And then, you know, to Lily's credit, she like won the gold by a lot. And it was an incredible moment for a clean sport. And like, I'm so proud of how courageous she was um, and like, didn't let that pressure that I don't think she necessarily wanted 
or, you know, sought out herself, but that was put upon her. And she still like does an incredible, she's, you know, a great advocate for clean sport. And yeah. um, after the race, Lily's NBC interview, I think she just straight up was like, yeah, I don't think drug cheats should compete at the Olympics or something along those yeah. lines. Um, and so in our press conference, so you do a press conference after your, you know, after you medal and usually the gold medal winner sits in the middle and then like the two people that sit on the side, but they put me in the middle. They <laughs> were afraid that they were going to get in a fight. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was really funny. And like at the end of the day, like all the three of us actually competed quite a lot and we competed again in 2017 and again in 2018. And like I swim against or used to swim against Yulia quite often. And there is this sense that like, okay, we're, we're kind of like friends in the, the weirdest sense of like, we're very united by this event. Yes. You cannot be like a mortal enemy of someone you're going to run into once a month. <laughs> like it just is exhausting. So there is kind of a sense and Lily and Yulia have both like kind of stepped down a little bit. And now like, you know, they speak to each other. They say like good race and it is all still very much there, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty crazy, it was a, it was a very interesting moment in time and to like be part of that. You know? I, I can imagine. I mean, it was pretty blatant too. I mean, when we, we were starting to see a trip, like in 94, we went to Rome for world championships and we knew that the Chinese had been doping. And so they were swimming out of their mind. Um, and then they would put someone else to go get drug tested. Um, so there was like this whole thing, like, and they couldn't tell who was getting out of the water to get drug tested. And we were all like, wait, are you kidding me? Like, this isn't, I, we were literally, um, it, it, it was one of those things where we knew that the people who were swimming the tests, who were swimming the races, weren't getting tested. The girl who beat me in the three disappeared three weeks later. Um, yes. she beat me and then she, uh, tested positive three weeks later and she disappeared. So 96, apparently what, um, you, uh, the world WADA did the world anti-doping agency is they pretended they were going to go and they were, they knew their phones were being tapped. So they were saying, we're going now to go test them. So I guess they threw off their cycle. So 96, we were expecting to see a whole blowout of the Chinese and we didn't see it. Um, and, um, there were certain cases where you knew isolated, um, uh, you, you knew, and there were more whispering and stuff, but that was one where it was very blatant. And we knew because some of them had tested positive, um, and they would also like do amazing and all of a sudden disappear. Right. And you never see them again. Yeah. Yeah. Super frustrating. Um, and 2000, I'm like trying to think, I don't remember, but I, I remember it's always been something kind of where you're looking at, I knew the girl I swam against in 200, um, in the 200 IM, I, I know, and I know now because I know somebody who was on her team and he would tell me, oh yeah, you want to know what she was taking? I can wow. tell you. Wow. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This, you know, I'm not even going to go into who it was and stuff, but it's those things that yes. honestly, I look at it and I go, it, it's grounding to me because I think swimming is just one part of my life, but the way it's become more of a career for people, I can imagine how much more investment you feel in that respect. I can yeah. understand in certain countries, you win an Olympic medal, your family is set for life. Yeah. Here, yeah. Now it's coming, becoming that. And I feel like as a sport becomes more marketable like that, it's like the, just the stakes go higher. It's, it's totally, yeah. it's wild. So anyway, it's been so nice talking to you about this. I feel like. Oh, no, yes. Have- <laughs> also, I, like, I feel like we, I would like just have this conversation offline anyway. So this is yeah, like, I'm like, and I want to hear your so story. It's supposed to live in. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, story. Um, but it was so nice and it's so good to see you. So good to see you too. And we'll have to, I mean, it will be fun to watch, you know, we're excited to be doing this, but you know, the yeah. excitement is, the, is Tokyo. So we'll both be really excited to see. And I think people are going to swim so fast at trials and oh at the Olympics. Um, so yeah, this was a, this was wonderful and I'm glad to see you and hear from you and I'm glad everything's going great.